Let's kick off, guys. Uh, we're happy to be here. Good afternoon, everybody in Europe. Good afternoon, everybody on the US coast, everybody on the Asian coast. So we're happy to see you again. This is another Crypto Wednesday show where uh, me and my friend Gordon are hosting and we are inviting every week some of the very special people from the blockchain and crypto industry as our guest speakers, as our friends, industry friends, to share the latest insights. And before we get started and I introduce our speakers and, our, and my co-host Gordon to the call, let me first introduce myself. My name is Sander de Bruin. Together with Gordon, like I just mentioned, we are co-hosting this weekly Crypto Wednesday. This is episode number six. We have a really special topic today. So waves of crypto innovation charting to uh, 2020s. And we're very excited with our special guest today. We are, we are also grateful that uh, the guys are already here and share and are willing to share uh, their view on the markets giving us some insights. So we're, we're happy to have you on the call. We're happy also to see everybody in the live stream and maybe you're watching the recording. Well, thank you also for that. And before we get started, I just wanted to thank Iconic um, Digital Asset Management for powering and making this uh, Crypto Wednesday available. And before I hand over to uh, my friend Gordon, just a little background on myself. My name is Sander de Bruyne. I'm from Amsterdam, the capital city in the Netherlands. We are from Europe. Uh, nowadays, I'm the Chief Investment Officer working at Iconic, uh, that's located at the Financial Heart in the Netherlands. We call it Beursplein 5. This is where all the trades in the old economy and the new economy is happening. And I'm very happy to co-host together with Gordon and sharing and giving back to the industry that we are all very excited about. So I would like to know first, Gordon, where in the world are you this week, my friend? Can you tell from the background? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, it, 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 I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, it is 5.30 a.m. So I'm doing the virtual background for now. So you don't, because otherwise it is dark out there. Dark, dark, dark. But I'm happy to, you know, we're doing this at a convenient time for the rest of the world. And I'm happy to be up and, and have my coffee. And uh, Sander, I'm happy to, I love doing the show with you. Um, and again, this is us giving back to the crypto community and speaking to the, our smart friends, basically. So just real short, I'm Gordon Einstein. I'm the founding partner of Crypto Law Partners. I'm an attorney, I'm licensed in California and my sole practice areas are blockchain and crypto law. Um, I actually went back, I left law before and I actually went back in, which almost no one ever does because Bitcoin grabbed me. So I'm, I'm like the prisoner who escaped from prison, maximum security with Noriega and then checked myself back in because I missed it. So what, what, what can I say? And it's funny you ask where I am. I've, I've been grounded, of course, because of this COVID business for a couple months now. Exciting times. Mm -hmm. um, but I look forward to visiting everyone in their respective, ideally European locations. And so, Sandra, we, we have a great show. We have great guests today. Can you just give one minute about the Zoom rules, just so everyone's super clear? Sorry, say again. I'm Can you give one me. minute about our Zoom rules, the mute, unmute? Sure, sure, and sure. sure. Yeah, so we have, we have a big audience and we really appreciate and we're grateful for people from all over the world and different continents to participate. And uh, we have a, a few simple uh, house rules. So if you're uh, here in the live stream and maybe you've got some hot topics or some hot questions that you want to address to our guest speakers, you're more than welcome to share that. But please use the chat room where our moderator, Luke, will take care of the questions and we will gather all the, let's say, let's say the, the most uh, uh, important questions for this week's show, for this week's subject, we will put it on the table so our guest speakers, David, Rick, and David can answer those questions as good, as good as they can. So in the meantime, enjoy the show. Please all keep your microphone muted so we have optimal sound system. Uh, besides the live stream, we will also upload the show on our uh, YouTube channels. So make sure you check out also our previous show because like we said, this is already a show, crypto show, crypto website show number six. We're very uh, happy about that. Um, so, Gordon, I think that's it on the on the house rules. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Yes, and, and, and now enough about us because it's really about our guests. Exactly. So, uh, let's. Uh, David Johnson will probably be joining us shortly. He's having a connection issue. You know, here we are in 2020, and these things happen. Um, but I'm going to do the short version of the introduction, and then I'm going to let our guests sort of self intro because their backgrounds are so interesting and so diverse that even though I did pre-interviews with them, it's just more than I can succinctly state. So first of all, my good long-term friend, David Orban, globe-trotting intellectual, 
you know, VC venture impact investor. Um, just David is a true polymath. He is an es espresso aficionado. He is a man with his finger in several pots. He's, he's just been around the block. So David, good morning from Los Angeles and good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'd like to also greet my new colleague and dare I say new friend, uh, Rick Willard. Rick is, I had a chance to briefly speak with him uh, before the show. Rick is very smart guy, very deep background in all the ways of innovation relating to crypto and before. I should say all our guests have that, but he sort of dived in. He, he, you know, I'd say that these guys are OGs and for people outside the United States, it means original gangsters. Okay, they're original gangsters of tech in general, innovation, and you know, both our guests and soon all three of our guests, it, it's interesting, they, they had lives before crypto. I think for the most part, Crypto, or they appeared right before crypto brought them together. And though they had separate evolutionary tracks, their evolutionary tracks kind of coalesced and became parallel, and they became friends and colleagues based on a similar philosophical and ideological output. And they're not passive people. They, they have agendas, and those agendas to me are interesting, and they manifest certain sides of why people are get involved in blockchain and why they get involved in crypto. And it's just fascinating. Now, when the idea for this panel formed, um, I reached out to David Orban and I said, I'd love to have you as a guest. Please, you know, you know, you don't you don't tell Mozart that you want, you know, what kind of music and what you want him to write. You just kind of say, right, you know, go do it. So I said, what theme do you choose? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it, I don't know if you guys all saw Emma Dias. It's like, you know, just cut a note, cut, cut a few notes. You know, you can't do that. You just gotta tell, ask Mozart for a symphony. Um, so David came up with our theme of waves of crypto innovation, which is sort of a nice meta topic for diving into several detailed, interesting ideas that are related to the philosophy behind crypto. And I asked David, you know, please recommend two other panelists. Because, you know, I don't know everyone, you know, unlike David. So he brought on these guests. Um, David, but before we go into the specific waves of innovation and go deep, can you give us, if it's possible, sort of a two-minute statement of you? Just, you know, let the audience know who you are. Sure. Thank you for having me, and I will be happy to do that. Uh, you can start at Sopwatch. Um, I started in uh, artificial intelligence uh, 30 years ago, uh, and... Uh, then uh, went on uh, already in my 20s to uh, create and grow companies both in Europe and uh, in uh, uh, the US. Originally, I started uh, uh, in physics, uh, studying in the same university where uh, Galileo Galilei taught, uh, and uh, I dropped out. Uh, I decided early on that uh, if there were any uh, corporations that uh, only wanted to hire me because I had uh, the the piece of paper I didn't really want to to work there and um, I uh, have you maybe also wanted to escape Galileo's fate <laughs> well uh, the ability and the necessity of uh, breaking paradigms has uh, become more urgent uh, in the 20th and 21st century and we will talk about that later on uh, but um, I have always been fascinated by the future. I always say we are time travelers at uh, one minute per minute. So with better design, a future that we want to inhabit and we are proud of. And uh, so I was uh, involved in uh, uh, various uh, circles uh, uh, as well as uh, in uh, the group that uh, designed the Singularity University 12 uh, years ago founded by Ray Kurzweil and uh, Peter Diamandis. Mm -hmm. There we study exponentially accelerating change uh, and uh, the very consequence of that is to impose innovation at the edges. So for me, decentralized and distributed systems were natural and I went on to identify them uh, in, in many areas, describing their behavior in the Network Society Manifesto published by uh, the think tank I founded in London, Network Society Research. And uh, part of that is to identify many things as technologies, including finance. Many banks today recognize that they are in the technology sector and they will be eclipsed if they cannot innovate. 
some years ago, this wasn't this um, evident. Uh, but for me, the emergence of uh, Bitcoin and, 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 uh, and blockchain-based uh, cryptocurrencies uh, was not as much or only a, a very, very welcome surprise so that the mathematical solutions could come together, but really a relief because for many years before, as part of the cypherpunk movement as well, I was indeed looking forward to recognize uh, tools that are worthy of the ambitions of our civilization for these decades. And I'm sure you all agree that banknotes and checks and, and, and credit cards are not it. So um, that's a little bit about uh, uh, my background and uh, uh, we, will, we will have uh, many things to touch upon and go deeper for sure. We will. Now, I, I'm actually going to do a form of you know, show delegation here. Would you please introduce your friend and colleague, Rick? Well, uh, Rick and I uh, are uh, active in the New York scene, uh, really, uh, with different backgrounds, but converging through the excitement and enthusiasm uh, that uh, many people uh, have felt for uh, blockchain and, and crypto. And uh, this enthusiasm really draws uh, people who, who realize uh, the, the creative potential that the new technology allows. Uh, so uh, Rick and I uh, originally met in uh, the various uh, panels and conferences and parties. Um, if you uh, suffer from uh, FOMO, you should not even try to live in New York. Every night uh, there used to be, these days maybe less so, uh, uh, hundreds of events that are each unmissable for one reason or the other. So you really have to adopt the hashtag no FOMO and go for one, enjoy yourself and leverage the serendipity of the wonderful people that you are going to meet, Rick, for example, amongst them. So Rick, uh, go ahead. Thanks, David. Uh, okay, so before I get into my uh, heresy, for which I'm more well known probably, about Bitcoin. Uh, I'll just give you some background on how I got into this space uh, and what we do, Agentic as a company. Uh, I came from actually advertising. I'm a trained journalist uh, and I got into advertising because journalists don't make any money, especially in those days. And I have always been a sort of a techno geek and I have uh, always Try, just I've always been a tinkerer with technology. Uh, so moving forward, I got involved with, uh, with early, early uh, digital screens and wound up putting up the first digital uh, advertising screens in Times Square. We were the first uh, company in the Western Hemisphere to wow. put up big digital screens. So I did a lot of those in Times Square, as you might imagine. I got called out to Las Vegas, where I uh, was a top consultant with MGM uh, Resorts to look at their digital signage, which turned into internal signage, which then turned into the third screen, which was uh, the smartphone in 2007. And so I found myself deep in the app economy, sort of sideways by mistake. Uh, and I liked that world and got very involved and wound up at a certain point coming back to New York in 2010 and investing in uh, different apps and, and hardware applications as well. And then I ran across Bitcoin from Peter Bessinus, who was one of the uh, co-founders of the Bitcoin Foundation, uh, the original Bitcoin Foundation. And I had known him from, from the early days. So Peter convinced me very easily, because I, I love you know, new things, uh, to make an investment into Bitcoin, which I did. And uh, it, it was very intriguing to me. And as I wrapped my head around the the concept of this digital peer-to-peer -peer value, I, I began to think um, a lot of different things, which we'll go over later. Uh, but mostly I understood that there was no way to describe this phenomenon to the average person who was not connected to the tech world, especially in the early days. There's simply no way to describe it. So I said, the best way that I can help is to create a company uh, that's going to support each part of this emerging ecosystem and try to explain it on, on many different levels simultaneously. So I started a think tank, the world's first digital currency think tank called Mint Combine. 
Uh, that uh, was begun in 2012. And in 2015, I spun my present company out of that. And we essentially support uh, both the entrepreneur level, uh, the community level, and the financial level uh, of this growing ecosystem. Now that, of course, has evolved over time. Uh, some of these companies aren't startups anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, of course, through natural attrition are dead or have morphed into something else. And we've ridden all of these waves and we've made some investments and, we, and we've essentially uh, uh, worked for clients as well. And I, I should point that out. So a lot of our clients are at the government level. Um, we were uh, chief blockchain consultants for the country of Luxembourg, uh, for the port of Rotterdam and the Hague. Uh, and we had offices at one point in Paris, London, uh, Zurich, and Sao Paulo. Uh, did a lot of work in Brazil as well. We actually introduced, I, I believe, I, I could be wrong, uh, but I believe that we introduced blockchain uh, writ large into Brazil. Uh, we did that with a company called Getronix, uh, which is now sold a couple of times over, $2 billion company. So we've been in this space uh, since its inception. Uh, we've been able to chart a trajectory uh, which allows us, uh, because of our membership, you know, it's part of the supporting the ecosystem is also having a lot of companies. So at one point, and David knows, we had about 58 member companies around the world. Uh, okay, so so let, let, me, let me jump in for one second, because when you and I talked before the show, I don't know if you recall, because my, my jaw, when you said 58, slammed off my skull and hit the table, because the ability to manage and juggle 58 companies is something I would personally vastly incapable of. So just I got I to gotta ask on behalf of all the entrepreneurs watching this from now until for the next 40 years, as this becomes a rolling classic, how the hell? Get used to not sleeping. <laughs> okay. That's, that's about my, my, my best advice is, is learn not to sleep. But, um, uh, you know, and that, that had its place in time. I, I, I think that um, we had to, we actually took a lot of that online now. Uh, we, and that was planned prior to COVID. It wasn't uh, a result of COVID. But uh, mm -hmm. I, David's a part of the network. I mean, we've known each other forever. So it, it's, it's something that uh, is still necessary, but it's now necessary to think more deeply about uh, some things that we'll talk about. I, I don't want to, to, to this way, uh, uh, rather to derail the conversation by starting too soon. But that's sort of my background and where I came from and how I got involved. Uh, and we tend to think along the lines of a think tank as well as a product and venture lab uh, to look at the deeper uh, uses for digital currencies and blockchains. Um, we have gone through the phase of, yes, you know, the Wall Street ETFs and all of this. I, I ran a publicly traded company. I was one of our members in Toronto called Global Blockchain Technologies, and we did a $40 million raise in Toronto. Uh, so we, we've been all over the map with this thing. Uh, and I've come out with what I believe are my own very definitive beliefs about the ecosystem and where it's headed uh, based on the fact that we've had a lot of input from around the world for many years. Uh, so we are able to see this very clearly, uh, in, in my opinion. So that's, I guess, what we'll get into later on. Right. And that's actually perfect because that leads into the, the, the common theme that I sort of picked up from speaking with all three of you is you're all three wrestling with and have to some extent reached the conclusion about whether the role of crypto and blockchain is to play nice with the incumbents and bring them along or to build a, an alternative which will eventually take the throne, <laughs> you know, coup or otherwise and sort of replace them. You know, is it, is it, is it supporting the existing system? Is it acting in parallel to it? Or is a new thing? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back, just to kind of keep some you know rotate through everyone. I'm gonna pass it back to David. Um, David, you, you and I had an interesting conversation. It's interesting as a lawyer listening to you. I think as a non-lawyer, uh, lead off with the Grokster case, the U.S. Supreme Court case, and you made an argument that I had not heard articulated before. And we'll, we'll talk about the details, or you'll talk about the details on the case for a second. But you, you kind of made the argument that that legal case, in a way, thank God for it, because it's more restrictive approach 
to intellectual property and innovation, like everything else like that, spurred a backlash. And the backlash has been hugely beneficial, which I guess was interesting point number one. And interesting point number two is it's funny because the incumbents always seem to fight these innovations, yet always seem to benefit from them then. I remember you making that point. But I wonder if that's really true with crypto and blockchain, whether it will ultimately benefit the existing incumbents. So can you start off, um, explain to the audience the Grokster case, what happened and where it went from there? Uh, Corey Doktorov, the um, science fiction author who uh, was the global ambassador for the Electronic Frontier, Foundation tells the sequence of how uh, from more than 100 years ago uh, to the beginning of the 21st century, uh, very often it would be the case that even though incumbents would fight against innovation, uh, often trying uh, to block it through legal means, uh, uh, there would be pushback uh, against that tactic and uh, they would end up benefiting from uh, uh, the, the innovation itself. Uh, player pianos uh, were opposed uh, from the union of uh, live orchestras. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, radio broadcasting system was uh, fought uh, against. Uh, when uh, the um, free to air television signals were uh, mm -hmm. being repurposed through the cable television because uh, uh, among the New York skyscrapers, uh, the uh, radio waves couldn't service uh, the, uh, the, the people uh, in the apartments. Uh, that uh, was illegal. Oh, yeah, I did not know that. that. That's fascinating. Is that, that was really illegal why? Until, until it became legal. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, one of the most uh, famous ones is uh, when the Hollywood uh, industry targeted uh, the VCR, uh, and in oral arguments, uh, uh, they compared it uh, to Jack the Ripper uh, for, for their industry. And in each of these cases, the Supreme Court uh, um, basically said, technology is neutral, go back, uh, uh, work it out, uh, the business models will manifest themselves, and you will just have to embrace it. So, Today, uh, if uh, you are Michael Jackson or own the rights to the Beatles um, uh, repertoire, and I am a newcomer and our songs are played on the radio, you don't have the right to go to the radio and negotiate a differential licensing uh, uh, agreement, but mm -hmm. everybody through a universal compulsory licensing gets paid the same. Mm -hmm. And um, when peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies uh, through the wonderful uh, uh, evolution uh, pushed by Moore's law uh, became uh, useful, uh, even though uh, the original architecture, uh, architecture of the internet itself is peer-to-peer, -peer, there was no concept of client-server computing back uh, in, in the 70s, let's say, or, or, or 80s. But at the, at the turn of the century, um, personal computing devices uh, started to take advantage of that. And whether it was uh, uh, Napster or whether it was eDonkey or many other um, uh, programs that, that some of us remember, they were fiercely attacked under copyright violation uh, arguments. And some of them folded like Napster, for example, even though at the same time why they were about to give up uh, uh, under the onslaught of more than 100 simultane simultaneous lawsuits, they were preparing the paid plan that 20 years earlier would have given you an Amazon Prime or Apple iTunes uh, like uh, Apple Music like uh, experience. Uh, without the burden of the centralized uh, data center infrastructure that, uh, that we have today. But one company didn't fold because they knew their history and uh, they uh, went up to the Supreme Court, expecting that the Supreme Court would once again say technology is neutral, go back and work it out. The business models will manifest themselves. And that is not what happened. Uh, because Grokster lost uh, uh, against uh, Universal Music, 
uh, and uh, uh, peer-to-peer technologies were basically criminalized. And um, all the uh, enthusiasm for uh, being able to make financial sense out of the revolution uh, dried up. And uh, with, with no venture capital investment, with no um, ability uh, by entrepreneurs to uh, eschew the, 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 the pretense of universal jurisdiction of uh, uh, the Department of Justice uh, spurred on by the Hollywood industry as demonstrated by King.com's uh, uh, 3 a.m experience with uh, anti-terrorist forces uh, kicking uh, down his door in New Zealand uh, uh, because uh, he was uh, violating copyright. Well, uh, uh, everybody seemed to- Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly. Right, allegedly. And, uh, and, uh, and everybody did not give up. Um, and uh, and uh, that, is, that is the evolutionary pressure at least partially, because there was no guarantee that gave rise to, to, to Bitcoin as we know it uh, in its uh, uh, pseudonymous form uh, in the convergence of various pieces that were needed for it to, to work as, as, it, as it works uh, still, still today. So that is a little bit, uh, in my view, of, of the universe uh, bifurcating. And the fact that we are sitting on the branch that, uh, that has the, the features uh, that it has, whether it is uh, better or worse, um, we have uh, no way of communita- communicating with other branches of the multiverse yet. So, uh, so it is hard to compare, uh, but, uh, but certainly um, uh, the, 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 the architecture of our global communications network is, uh, is uh, primed to fail spectacularly because uh, our, uh, um, our belief that the centralized systems that we use are optimal is, is uh, naive at best, uh, corrupted uh, to the extreme at worst. Mm. Yep. The, um... So let me let me chart the course for, you, course for you personally. You you have this point of view. You're aware of the Grokster case. You, you gave a great example during our conversation that you know, you're, you're you're kind of withholding judgment during this one. But previously you said we're in a branch of the universe, or we're in a branch of reality where if you and I sit down in a cafe, our phones can you know these wonderful supercomputers we hold in our pockets can't do cool things on our behalf, negotiate amongst themselves because we live in this sort of siloed Amazon, Google. Yeah, let me, let me, sure. Let me um, describe that because it is so evident uh, to to anybody. Um, How many times um, during a a nice lunch, uh, our conversations, because we love technology, uh, go to the latest app uh, that, that we like. And, and I show you my phone, you show me yours, and we compare which are the apps that uh, uh, I think you should have and, mm-hmm. and you think I should have. And then rather than the syncing and exchanging of these apps already happening as we speak, without us even having to realize because our phones are totally able to do that, actually our phones taunt us by recommending apps we should install, mm-hmm. but they are um, purposefully made dumb by Neutered. an industry that uh, uh, is unable to accept how much more useful they could be to us. They cannot t- talk to each other. They are prohibited from exchanging apps peer to peer from one to another, we have to go through the centralized servers in order to uh, uh, obtain them. And and um, anybody telling you that uh, that the reason for this is because then nobody would pay for the things is is ridiculously uh, misguided. 
So this is just one example, but there are many, many more of how um, the, uh, how, how uh, uh, counterproductive really the current arrangement uh, is. Now you, you also made the point, and I want you to speak of this, and then I want Rick to comment and see if you guys are on the same page or if you kind of have a delta. The, this overall point you're making seems to apply to your view of government and regulation as well. You, you raised the issue previously that regulators are not neutrally viewing these technologies. They're actually, so I, I, think, I think you made the point that, you know, people get enthusiastic because they see an opportunity with the new tech. They then, and everyone kind of bandwagons. And, the, you know, you get this wave effect. And, the, you know, the reason it goes up and then goes down like a wave is people bandwagon on the next new thing, which had, of course, its seeds in the prior thing. They try to implement that next new thing. They run into headwinds when they actually try to do something. You know, there's difficulty involved. And then they kind of regroup and go to the next big thing, you know, picking up the pieces from the prior thing. But you're, you added to that the idea that regula the regulators or regulation is not just causing friction because it's regulation, but because the regulators are consciously and proactively doing two things, protecting incumbents, and especially with blockchain and crypto, protecting themselves as incumbents, as governmental, classical Westphalian type government incumbents. And I, you opined, and I thought somewhat radically, that I think, you know, nation states and governments got to go. And you referred to two upcoming kinds of freedom. You talked about genetic freedom. You know, just because we're born in this body, that doesn't mean we have to stay in this body in a way. It's sort of a transhumanist point of view, I think I heard. And also maybe geographical freedom. You know, just because I'm born in Nicaragua or Australia or the United States, that accident of geographical location at birth is illogically coupled to my ability as an adult or pseudo adult to choose my nation and maybe nations aren't physical. So there, you have an ideological kind of point of view. Can you, first of all, tell me if this is a fair representation of your views, expand upon this and then- I have so nothing more to add, Gordon. You read out the notes of the things I told you at the pre-show briefing perfectly. So we are done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm a parrot. I, I can sound smart by repeating what a genius says. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. So, so, so uh, uh, let, let, me, let me express my, my thoughts, uh, um, if, if I may. Um, the, the head of the SEC is uh, called Marie Antoinette. And uh, she is saying, qu'il mangeant de la brioche. Let them eat cake. The uh, uh, regulators are saying, why are all these people bothering me with these newfangled things? What are they pretending? What, what should they be doing anything more than we are already doing? This monarchy, this feudal system that we have, that we call the United States and the new world order after the collapse of the Soviet Union are perfectly fine. Everybody just should stay put in their place. And I am not advocating violence at all. What is the historical precedent is that when tension is, is accumulating, wars and revolutions are the blunt tools that make space for new solutions to be uh, tested and implemented. So, Paradoxically, it is in the incumbent's interest, and they are too myopic to see that, to carry out as many possible experiments as possible in order to find out what works, rather than, one, pretending that they have the answers, which by definition they cannot have, exactly because of the nature of, of interconnected complex systems, where uh, the, the uh, particular uh, consequences, especially side effects of, of whatever you decide and however you decide to do it, cannot be uh, worked out beforehand. And two, that it is indeed possible to establish uh, sandboxes and put uh, safeguards so that 
uh, the experiments are carried out uh, without infecting the broader system. And then once you realize, wow, this is really powerful, then you uh, uh, let it uh, go more freely. And, and if you do that, then you can manage uh, the evolution, which is unstoppable anyway, of uh, the complex system we call uh, uh, technological civilization. The important reason, the fundamental reason why, should not, why we should not uh, allow ourselves to let tension accumulate to the point where a war or a revolution is, is the solution, even though we are the descendants of the winners who wrote the history books and their enemies were dead and wrong, uh, is, is because we have nuclear weapons. And, and maybe, uh, it, you know, a, a, a nice global war with China from the United States would not uh, uh, extinguish the human race. And there could be some uh, uh, misguided ecologists who would cherish uh, the diminishing uh, uh, pressure on the ecosystem uh, and, and they would point their, um, their fingers to, to Chernobyl saying, oh, look at how uh, vibrant uh, and, and greening that whole area is. Wouldn't Earth be better without uh, humanity? But I point my finger to the wider universe where, as of right now, there is nobody in awe like we are about what is possible. And it is really our responsibility to make sure that, that, that the human experiment continues. So um, that is why it, the, the, whether it is uh, solar in energy or uh, 3D printing in manufacturing or precision fermentation in, in uh, food production or blockchain in finance, the new technologies are urgent and we should embrace them and explore their implications and have millions of startups fail. That is the uh, bet we are making. We are encouraging young and old people to sacrifice their lives and their mental sanity in doing something as crazy and cr as creating a startup and trying to make it succeed in the knowledge that 99% of them will fail. Well, Omar. in the 2017 ICO craze, 99.99% .99 of them failed. Good, yeah. good, necessary, necessary because only if we do the experiments, we will find the ones that work. And the regulators, as of today, don't understand that. They are ready to sacrifice the future of the universe to make sure that you and I cannot dream to be more creative than they allow. Fascinating. Rick, let me, let me pass it to you and I'm going to sort of play up David's point and then you can play jazz with it. You have an interesting conception on the evolution of value. Sort of the extraction to exclusion, I think your term was, and how that gets enabled by technology. Can you lay that out for us and then kind of integrate that with David's comments about the way where technology is now, what that's allowing or not allowing? Sure. Um, and, and let me first uh, agree with David's last point, really, uh, more emphatically, uh, that the only way to grow this ecosystem is to grow through failure. Uh, that is how all things do arise. It's how, you know, you have to kill a thousand flowers to make a beautiful rose. So it's uh, incumbent upon us. I mean, when I first started, uh, when we, we were a think tank uh, in 2012, we started talking to a lot of corporations and governments about so here's this Bitcoin thing. Now there, it's interesting. It it it, uh, it it could be programmable money. It could be a lot of different things. Uh, but um, what is it to you? And we got a lot of feedback from around the world. I mean, we did feasibilities for the Malaysian government, for the Saudi government, for different different uh, governments around the world. And they said, well, look, um, yes, there was some pushback, but there was mostly in the more intelligent people we spoke to. 
a recognition that we were, in fact, unknowingly at the time, setting up the stage for redefining value itself. Value comes um, and is calibrated and informed and determined by our values as a society. So you see uh, the advent of paper money in China. Uh, and that was enforced not by any kind of assets, not by anything except the emperor's decree. And if you didn't use the paper money, you might get your hands chopped off, might get your head chopped off. So you accept this and be quiet. This is our promise to you. And that's it. Right. There's no gold backing that up. There's no, you know, no barrel or silo of assets. So uh, we move forward in time and paper money and, and banking again. Now, banking, again, is is a, a social phenomenon. And banking is a technology, as, as David pointed out, that has a distinct set of rules. And those rules, they happen to be pointed towards the benefit of European society. Right. And so the extractive methods of all kinds of colonial capitalism and all kinds of things, you know, could have entered into this mix to create what we call capital today. Mm -hmm. And that's asset backed for the most part, for the most part. Now it's debt backed. <laughs> now who, who knows? I mean, we're completely decoupled from, from the reality of value. And then this mm -hmm. is the point. Capitalism has, is winding itself into its natural conclusion. All right. Debt can only go so far. The, the, uh, Sorry, let me give you one second. The capitalism is winding to its conclusion or the sort of finance debt capitalism? Are we going to capitalism 3.0 or are we just going to something else entirely? Capitalism writ large it is, is doing its job. It's doing its job. It's actually creating a space where it decouples completely from human experience. And we're finding that in New York Stock Exchange right now. The, the NYSC has no bearing in truth for the actual U.S. economy. None, almost none at all. Yeah. Okay. So that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to live over here. But human capital and human value now is being lifted up, in my opinion, through digital, the advent of digital value and digital currencies that can be made by communities. We have a saying at Agentic, you know, there's community which we creates an ecosystem, which then gives you an economy. And that economy is backed on the value that is uh, created throughout that community, be it dispersed or local or whatever. The internet allows us to have communities that are you know, based with, on individuals all over the world, uh, or it can be geographically located as well. So uh, I don't see uh, Bitcoin anymore as the be all and end all of this conversation. Uh, I think whether Bitcoin lives or dies is actually inconsequential. The, uh, we're, we're much actually further past that than, than many would like to admit because all of us have holdings in Bitcoins. We want to say, oh, Bitcoin's wonderful. Bitcoin is a model T Ford and the Ferrari. I guess you saw my pained smile when you made the comment that Bitcoin can live or die. <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. is a model. Think of Bitcoin as the model T Ford. Okay. It's, it's a test run. Mm -hmm. Can value be created outside of the established channels? And what does that look like? Bitcoin has been co-opted, quite frankly, more by the, uh, by the right than the left. Uh, and if you look at people who are holding Bitcoin and what they're doing with it, it's much more of a radically right function in many cases. And you can look at places in South Africa, you can look at the, uh, the ETFs here in New York, and look at individuals in the West Coast. Uh, or expats who are doing all kinds of high, high profile things with Bitcoin. But the idea that value can be created outside of the central banking system or the European banking system, let's be specific about that, is a very important idea. Because that allows that decoupling of capital to occur naturally. And for people using the internet, of course, to be able to band together to create their own forms of value, be it through products, ideas, inventories, or whatever have you, whatever can be expressed. When I say ideas, think of intellectual property, right? Mm -hmm. so you can have a group of scientists who form a community who actually have a lot of IP. Well, blockchain can help them track and trace that IP to attribute that IP and do the payment rails all at the same time. Now, right? so let, let me ask you, the, I, I see how value sort of can be spontaneously generated by decentralized groups 
acting because of the system incentives. Not, in not, not spontaneously. You have planned economies. I, 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 I was speaking to a friend of mine. I was speaking to a friend of mine last night, mm -hmm. and she uh, reminded me of something that that I, I thought was very important in this conversation, and uh, it's called susu in certain uh, communities, uh, and it's it's a African, it's a West African thing where people band together to create. Uh, opportunities for each other. They'll pool money together and uh, they'll have like lotteries and different kinds of things like that. In, in, in New York, I remember people used to have rent parties, right, to help each other. And that's mm -hmm. sort of pay, pay money to have a party in somebody's apartment and they pay the rent with that money. But, you know, a little bit larger, these communities have always generated income internally, okay, especially marginalized communities. I've, I've always done this. This is not anything new. Now, it's, it's on steroids when you talk about uh, the internet but you have to understand also that the idea of value on the internet or peer-to-peer -peer value is not new and did not start with Bitcoin. It started with companies like DigiCash and eCash in the 90s that tried to you know, solve this 402 dilemma. And for those of you who don't know, the 404 page we all know, you know this page not found here, right? You, you go to a page on the web and it says 404, page not found. Mm -hmm. Well, the 402 page is the payments page of the internet. And that was supposed to carry all of the financial transactions of the internet. Uh, that's how it was conceived. Well, it's never been used. It's never been used. And we defaulted because it was too hard to solve the double spend problem, which Bitcoin did effectively. Uh, if I give you a dollar, that dollar no longer exists in my pocket. It now exists in your pocket. And that's a, a, a viable, you know, it's a logical transaction. Well, that digitally could not be done until Bitcoin. So that, that's the innovation that Bitcoin really introduced uh, onto the internet, really parallel to the internet, not really on the internet itself. So, sorry, let, let, let me ask you this part. I, I, I get, I understand what you're saying about Susu and rent parties, and I, you know, in my own mind, you that kind of brought me back to that movie Witness with Harrison Ford, where the the Amish bond together and make a barn in one day for a new married couple through their massive group effort, and everyone can kind of you know, there's a, a trust society in place mm -hmm. you know, where you kind of know that's going to happen. Does that work for building airports and operating railway stations over a course of centuries? How do you, how do you operate at that complexity level? That's why capital itself will may never die. You can't build, you know, a, a steamship or an aircraft carrier with that kind of uh, participation. I mean, you could eventually, I suppose, but right now you can't, right? So mm -hmm. capital markets are always going to do what they do. But capitalism, is its natural conclusion is to point fail at the human level and to build those bigger things, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the future of work, let me just, now I, you're forcing me to sidetrack, but uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just conclude <laughs> uh, that last part by, by saying that the idea of aligning human value more with uh, generated economies and distributed economies is going to happen. And it has to happen based on what capital is doing in capitalism. Right? It is decoupling almost completely. So how do people find work? Robots are taking over work. Uh, software bots are, are taking over intellectual work even, or certainly task-based work. So people are going to have to find a way to use the internet in a way that they're already doing through Instagram and the Kardashians are, are, are perfect examples of this. They're both producers and consumers simultaneously. They both produce content, consume content. We're going to see a lot more of that online. So the payment rails that blockchain enables for people to do that are now in place. That, that can happen. And that is its own digital currency. And we see a spate of currencies come out as a result of that, that try to address uh, different problems. But uh, there, look, this is not new. None of this is new. Before the Civil War in America, we had over 10,000 currencies. We had currencies localized, we had bank currencies, we had regional currencies, we had municipal currencies, you know, all over the country. The US dollar, uh, the greenback, is a result of civil war debt repaid to the North and then became an instrument of the Marshall Plan uh, to, to bring in uh, uh, Latin American countries into the uh, American economic fold, for better or for worse. So, so this is not a new thing. The U.S. itself is a decentralized application, Gordon. You and I talked about that. Right. Uh, so we're really good at, at, at envisioning a at least a federated model, if not a decentralized model. 
about how things work. So it's no wonder that America sort of latched on to this concept first. And, and it's a natural progression of money. Uh, I, I, I would say that to David's point, the reason why, and this goes all the way back, that everything is driven by the values that money silos off. Why don't phones speak to each other without the rent seekers and, and gatekeepers and middlemen? Uh, is because of money. It's because of capital. It's because people have vested interests in keeping their silos running. So if I haven't made it, then I'm going to put up a construct where you have to pay me to do these functions, right? And this is, and that's, now that completely goes into the nature of our values. Should society be free? Okay, now you can say free physically or you, or you can say free monetarily. Sorry, right? do, do the systems, do the inherent nature of the systems drive the values or are our systems emergent properties of our values? It's a snake eating its own tail. It's both at the same time. That's a di 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 the dichotomy of value itself is that they drive each other, like just like art uh, and uh, and reality. I guess you know which is which is predominant. Well, they, they both are, and they both work off of each other. Right? Interesting. Okay. So that, that's a human condition. There is no one thing ever. There's a combination and a confluence of events and of things and of people that create this flow that it's a continuum that we move forward on, but we never really change all that much as human beings. So and, this and, and if, I'm, if I may add to that, um, sure. the, uh, our, our ability to dream uh, and our ability to implement uh, evolving and ever more ambitious uh, societies that adopt moral systems that give purpose and value to human life uh, improve with technology. Uh, it doesn't matter how ambitious the ancient Greeks were and how admirable their philosophy books still are. They lived in a society that perfectly accepted slavery. And as a matter of fact, if you ask them, they would be totally flummoxed by, by, by your pretense that uh, it would be possible to create a society without slaves. Our Aristotle would be completely floored by that concept. But, and, uh, and, and the fact that today we can, the only difference is not we are better people, we have better technology. Well, so, we have, yeah, we, we, we got the cotton gin that made a huge swath of slavery, you know, unnecessary because it mechanized the process of, of separating, you know, cotton from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, I would agree with you. People, even, the, even some of the poorest Americans live with the amenities of kings of a thousand years ago, right? Running water, flushing toilets, it's just unheard of stuff that a thousand years ago would have made you one of the wealthiest people on earth. But the... What I'm trying to say here is that the recalibration of value is not an easy thing because it bites at the heart of how society is set up. And yes, does it make life from an exi existential standpoint, you know, existing standpoint, easier and better to a large degree? But, you know, we said computers would get rid of paper, right? Well, they didn't. They increased the flow of paper. Printers increased the flow of paper. So there are unintended consequences all the way around. So who's to say what is better or worse? It simply is. Uh, I, I, I want to go back to this, this concept, though, of the future of work and the, and the abstract of decoupling value. Uh, in this vacuum that we're finding, where people need to find new, new ways to work, new ways to make a living for themselves, to create value that people want to exchange with them so they can survive, all this is, is moving to the digital realm for the most part. And in that prosumer society, in that, in that producer consumer society, you will find the currencies that displace Bitcoin. You will find a multiplicity, I believe, of currencies, uh, thousands of them. Uh, and that's already in play. You find uh, Orania in South Africa, the Orania community, if you're familiar with them. They're a white separatist community uh, that decided they want to, to only deal with Afrikaner culture. Okay, that's fine. As far as I'm concerned, you're not hurting anybody, fine. You don't come out with a flag with a swastika, do your thing. Uh, they have their own digital currency. That's based on the RAND, oddly enough, which is a South African currency, which is run by Africa, 
you know, Afri black Africans, right? So it, it's, it's, it's funny how, how the, these, these value systems can collide as well, but still be augmented. So it just goes to show you that it's creating a new type of world where relationships are actually morphing. And that's the human values part that I'm really talking about, right? We don't know, slavery is unnecessary now. Robots are our slaves. We're building new slaves. Software is our slave, yeah. you know? We, we, we've morphed past the human aspect of slavery and we're building slaves from the ground up because humans will always need slaves. I think Aristotle, by the way, David would understand that. I think he would get that. Oh right. well, yeah, so, we're gonna look at Freud and he, he said, you know, tools make humans prosthetic gods. So we're just, you know, slavery was like tool 1.0, unspecialized and, and clunky, but it was what was available at the time. Dude, I think to David's point is just, or actually both of your points, new stuff shows up, we figure out new ways to use it. And that idea of using a human seems, forget the moral issue, seems archaic since you have right. something so specialized available. So where does Bitcoin fit in all of that? That's why I say Bitcoin is inconsequential. Bitcoin is not the way it's used right now, the, uh, the be all and end all of anything. It simply is an introduction. It's, it's digital currency 101. Uh, and it's teaching us about ourselves more than anything else and about how in a peer-to-peer -peer environment we might be able to create value together. I think it's being abused personally right now by many people, uh, but that's the nature of technology. It, it, I, 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 would, uh, I would agree half with David by saying that technology is not inert. Technology is not neutral. Technology is both a sword and a shield simultaneously depending on who's wielding it. Sure. So it's like Captain America's shield, right? You can, you, can, you can block, you know, a, 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 a ray, an x-ray, or you could fling it at somebody and cut their head off. You know, you can do both those things simultaneously. So uh, I, I don't ever consider technologies to be inert. Uh, it all depends on who's, who's wielding them. But the, so that's kind of my take on all of this. Um, and, and I get that from a multiplicity of sources, right? So we, as I said, we deal with a lot of companies. We also deal with a lot of uh, philosophers, a lot of thinkers, work very closely with Jeremy Rifkin. Let me pause you one second and then I'm gonna hand it back to you. Where I was gonna go next, and you're kind of segueing into it perfectly. Can you lay out for us how you, through Agentech, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Agentech. What was, what's neat about all of you, all three of you, is you're taking your, philo your philosophies and your ideologies and you're practically applying them through your entities. And, it's, and you're teaming and like you're, you're walking the walk. So how are you through your business practices implementing your philosophy, mm -hmm. choosing projects and everything else? Yeah, our, our, our best known case, and we're, we're building some new things right now, but our best known case was as consultants for the country of Luxembourg. So they have a 35 year, I guess a 30 year now, digital digitalization program to digitize the entire country of Luxembourg. Uh, IOT, finance, transportation, waste management, energy, et cetera, right? Every facet of living will be digitized. And so they called us and said, yeah, but how do we tie all this together? And we said, well, blockchain, right? Okay. So we spend a year in Luxembourg uh, planning out how blockchain, my, myself and Michael Casey, who was my partner at the time, uh, mm -hmm. who you may know, know of uh, in this space, went over to Luxembourg. We spent a year over there. We said, okay, here, here's the deal. Uh, how do, and we had to think very hard about community dynamics. We had to think about the nature of, of value between neighbors and exchange. We had to think about energy use. We had to think about waste management policy, we had to think about transportation policy and all of these other things. So we got really hardcore training in this space. Uh, but we are presently now not only um, simplifying those models to the point uh, that we can, but also enacting them in our own online environment uh, and helping others realize tokenized environments for different forms of access or different forms of utility and different forms of value creation. Uh, we've spent years talking to artists, talking to people. How do you, uh, and this is old now, it's an old example. We all know the, you know, that yes, you can, you can uh, tokenize digital art, but try to tokenize a Rembrandt and you'll find out how hard it really is, right? So we uh, have all of these different concepts we've been throwing around. Some of them, uh, I think, work better than others. And it's not clear that everything that humans do can be tokenized, and I doubt that's the case at all. 
but I do know uh, that the value creation, which will form a new set of values. I mean, look, when I say value and values, let me pull it back for a second. It's really an important concept to grasp. Communication itself is very different pre-internet, right? And the advent of the internet informed our global societal values in such a way, and I don't, I'm not saying it's all positive, right? The advent of fake news became a thing for us, and now it's embedded in our cultures. The concept of it, uh, mm -hmm. used for better or for worse. It's something that we, that Noam, Noam Chomsky would have said pre-internet with his pamphlet Lies of the Times, where we consider the New York Times to be a bunch of liars. Now they're the bastions of truth compared to all the stuff that's out here, yeah. right? You know, so our values do change based on our technologies. You know? uh, and when you add that very essential, existential uh, concept of stuff that helps you live, like money, like trade, like value that, that impacts your lifestyle, that's going to have a severe impact on society because that is at the visceral core. That, that's, that's, at, that, that's in that you know, hierarchy of needs. Yeah, that's, I was thinking Maslow. You know, when you were saying that, I'm like, yeah, that, that strikes at the core. Think Maslow, and that strikes at the heart of humanity, of, of one's you know, being, one's existential self. So you're going to get visceral reactions and you're going to get visceral actions as well. So that um, is a place that's uncharted for us. Does anyone have the answers? If you say you have the answers, you don't. I do know though, that humans are humans and we're fractal in that way. We take these things, we, the basic humanity is always there. So the basic mistakes are always there and the basic joys are always there. The basic wins are always there. But where this takes us now is completely uncharted territory. We, we may so, have- so, hmm? Sorry, but for your, for your venture, for your business, so suppose someone's watching this and they're intrigued and engaged by what you're saying. Who comes to you? Who do you want to come to you? with what like what what projects do you want to be involved in now like you know other than beyond learning because it, it's, it's great you're you all all of you struck me as practical implementers of your philosophies which is amazing what kind of person should reach out to you with what and what what will you do with them to make this happen or how can you manifest this i mean not one person for us but communities and we we look at okay. that community and we will try to what we call extrude identify and extrude the value inherent in that community and tokenize it based on the inherent properties that we see. Okay, that's great. That's interesting. And David, you were, I think you were on a, save, a separate uh, show with my pet friend, Pavel Kravchenko, talking about the future tokenization, if I remember correctly. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the commonality here. Um, Let me let me take it to David. With Network Society Ventures, you're also kind of walking the walk. Tell us about that and tell us how you're putting your philosophy into play and then who should reach out to you with what for the best results. Uh, so um, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, exponential technologies lead to decentralization naturally because it is at the edges that the experiments working out what works can be uh, uh, implemented. And the natural implementors of those experiments are the startups. So um, I first established the Network Society Research, which is a think tank that published the Network Society Manifesto that articulates how, in my opinion, uh, decentralization uh, is ever more strongly characterizing uh, a new socioeconomic uh, paradigm uh, and uh, the new social contract is going to be based on that as well. Um, the pandemic very clearly demonstrated uh, the failure of the nation states in being able and uh, execute uh, one of uh, the most fundamental reasons for their existence, which is the protection of, uh, of their citizens. Mm -hmm. But there are also many other uh, challenges to the human uh, civilization that nation states are totally ill-equipped to address, for example, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and uh, if you think about uh, the way that uh, a new solar and battery-based smart grid uh, generates and allocates uh, uh, electricity, or you think about how uh, a, a blockchain-based uh, decentralized uh, autonomous the organization uh, is... Uh, but they are also is uh, uh, going to be able to allocate financial resources based on whatever uh, governance mechanism the, the, the specific DAO will, will accept. These are all already uh, concrete implementations and indications of that new kind of, uh, of socioeconomic uh, organization. So Network Society Ventures uh, uh, has been born to catalyze those startups that at the intersection of exponential technologies and decentralization are passionately uh, and creatively applying their talent to work out uh, what uh, various uh, ways of addressing these challenges and uh, at the same time making a lot of money uh, uh, can, can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Network Society Ventures invests uh, at the seed stage uh, of, uh, of these companies in a geographically neutral manner, uh, or even uh, with, uh, with a, a, an adverse uh, selection, meaning that uh, we don't necessarily believe that Silicon Valley is the, uh, is the epicenter of the universe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, blockchain is famous for uh, having given birth uh, to some of the most interesting initiatives outside of Silicon Valley that really feels a little bit like a, black, uh, a backwater um, in, in, uh, in uh, blockchain uh, innovation. And uh, the, 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 the way that we invest, uh, of course, uh, as, as the title of uh, our show also illustrates, goes with the waves of uh, uh, technology uh, in, in blockchain. So we invested in, in, in blockchain capital, in the DAO, uh, we invested in... Uh, um, Wait, sorry, you mean the DAO? Like the big yeah, yeah, the, the DAO. I mean, look at the, the various, uh, um, you know, um, marks uh, and, and, and I could show you uh, all the war scars uh, that, uh, that these uh, experiences left uh, uh, on me as well as uh, on, on, on many other people. But uh, those are, are necessary. You know, how can you, how can you claim that you know what you're talking about if you never got your hands dirty? Uh, and, um, and, and so uh, if, you, if you came to me in 2017, I would have told you, absolutely, we are happy to, uh, to invest in tokens. And I still believe in the value of tokens and tokenization. It's just that regulators have been successful in emasculating uh, that uh, generation of, uh, uh, of, of, of experiments. I think some uh, founders did too, David. I think some, some founders actually did it to themselves in many cases. Well, oh yeah, no, no, of course, of course. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, a lot of people are, are very happy with the modest uh, innovation that um, security tokens represent. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, it is totally unexciting. You know, uh, we are in the third decade of the 21st century. Isn't it ridiculous that NASDAQ's computers need to rest by night and that they take off yeah. for the weekend when they go to the Hamptons? So uh, billions of people can't trade 24-7. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, security tokens and the digitization of traditional financial assets is not innovation. It's catching up to reality. Finally, please, after like four decades, it would have been uh, possible. Um, so well, I, I am looking forward to be able and back uh, ambitious startups uh, that uh, are ready to, to run risks. Can, can you, if, if it's okay to discuss, um, there's a solar exchange project you're involved in that seems like it manifests 
all the elements you're talking about or not specifically generically because I, I thought that was so so yes uh, it, it is uh, an example i always uh, love to uh, to quote um uh, the sun exchange is uh, one of our investments uh, they just recently closed uh, their a round meaning that the seed investment is now mark to market and uh, uh, it is uh, one of the traditional ways uh, for uh, investors to, to, to say that they were right, that, uh, that whatever startup they backed uh, didn't die yet. No guarantee that it won't in the future, but at least for the moment, they can claim to be smart. Uh, and, um, and the Sun Exchange uh, is a South African company uh, that has a, a, an online platform where anybody uh, from all over the world can go sign up and purchase uh, cells in a solar plant. Uh, literally purchase, you, you have the ownership of the cell and it is about $10 per cell. They are crazy enough so that if you really uh, want it, they will take the cell out of the plant and ship it to you. Uh, but you hopefully don't want that because the cells generate electricity that is sold locally and, and, uh, and the clients running these uh, plants are uh, schools and villages and uh, uh, shopping centers. There is an elephant sanctuary. And uh, um, I don't know if uh, similarly to the International uh, Energy Agency, which is the top authority uh, in the world about energy, uh, who has had their head buried in sand uh, for the past 20 years, literally. Uh, you have also missed it, but solar won. Solar energy today is uh, the cheapest energy in, the, in, in, in an increasing uh, uh, number of geographies. Uh, and I spent some time with the chief innovation officer uh, of an 80 billion uh, euro uh, utility company uh, who are ready not only to confirm their re leadership position in the installation of solar plants, but actually to go 100% renewable. They decided not even to try to re retrofit their carbon plants uh, because it's not worth it. So the mm -hmm. Sun Exchange generates electricity and you can be sitting in Norway where it's dark out of your window six months of the year and to be literally streaming the benefits and the upside of African sunshine in your digital wallet through the monthly Bitcoin payments that they make uh, for the yield of your solar cells. Or you can compound uh, your earnings by automatically purchasing additional cells uh, through the earnings uh, that uh, uh, the solar energy generates. Like and, reinvest and your dividends? And, and, this is, and this is beautiful. So, so um, and, and, and it has so many corollaries, you know, uh, the most relevant maybe for our audience, next time you hear that Bitcoin is wasteful, please respond to the person stating that Bitcoin is what drives the search for the cheapest electricity available, which today is solar. And as a consequence, Bitcoin is pushing solar adoption all over the planet. That is true. Yeah, yeah, that is beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Rick, I, I just want to ask something about that. So I, I know, Sun, you know, I, you, you shared that early on with me, that, that information about Sun. And they're, they're a great company. My question is, what is their relationship locally with, I mean, they're selling energy. Are they selling energy at a discount locally? Are they, is there any social benefit to their being in South Africa? Oh, oh absolutely, because uh, in, uh, in South Africa, the electric grid is very unstable. As a matter of fact, they have been uh, labeled an essential uh, uh, activity during the pandemic. So their installation activities were not uh, slowed down. Uh, they were able and and send workers to keep installing uh, the solar plants. And in many of these places, if not all of these places, the alternative is to install diesel generators right. uh, yeah. at, at, a, at a per kilowatt uh, uh, hour cost of energy, which is more or less 
300% of what the customers end up paying once everything is taken into account over the life of the, uh, of the solar plant, right? And, and, uh, and uh, the Sun Exchange operates uh, in a, in a middle, mid range, not at the consumer level and not at the utility scale. Uh, that is why those uh, examples I, I gave. And this is a, a, a huge but very severely neglected uh, segment of the market, uh, which uh, some uh, uh, advisors of Network Society Ventures said would not be big enough to uh, actually make the Sun Exchange successful. And, we, and I went, uh, as, as the lead on this investment, I went against the judgment of our own advisors, which is, is kind of crazy because you, 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 the reason you have advisors is to heed their advice, right? Uh, and and uh, today, um, the Sun Exchange has a pipeline that they don't think will, will ever end. They have a pipeline of, of projects uh, where the bottleneck now is really uh, evaluating and then and, and installing and, and nothing else. So the double-sided market, both in terms of, of how many people, oh, as an example, uh, the, the, um, uh, the plans go online uh, on the platform and they typically have 30 or 60 days uh, to be uh, sold, the, the sales. The average time for selling out, three hours, right? Mm -hmm. That is on the demand side. They have an agreement with a local bank uh, that is ready to uh, top up where demand were ever insufficient, and it never is. Uh, and on the supply side, well, they already have an unending pipeline and they are only in South Africa. So uh, imagine going uh, elsewhere just in Africa and then imagine going elsewhere worldwide. Uh, they are uh, ready to, to really explode uh, in a good way. It's amazing. It's, it's not, actually, I'm getting motivated and enthusiastic just listening to you. I, I want to break in for a second because David Johnson, Johnston, I should say, welcome. Thank welcome you. To the, the triumvirate, the, tro the, the troika <laughs> is, is now complete. And, you know, Stalin's been, we're waiting for Stalin, I guess. Um, welcome to the show. Just for everyone um, who's watching this, David Johnston is a, like our two other guests, a, a pioneer in this field of blockchain and cryptocurrency and decentralized systems. Um, he's been in, if I get this right, he built seven startups before you were 30 years old. I don't think I moved out of my mom's house until I was 30, but that's okay. Well, maybe you didn't either. <laughs> maybe that helped you build the startups. Um, David, one of your claims to fame is you invented, you personally invented the term DAP. Decent, decentralized or distributed application. And that hardly all you've done, but it's, it's amazing. Um, you're involved in now decentralized finance, protocol securities, you're on, are or were on the board of Polymath. You're, you've been around the block and you have an international flavor to you. Can you take a couple minutes? Um, I'm very happy to see your face. Can you keep a couple minutes and introduce yourself and just give us the executive summary of who you are, what you believe in your background? In, in 30 sure. seconds or less. No, just kidding. Sure. <laughs> sure. And thanks for having me. Um, you know, so I was lucky to hear about Bitcoin in 2012. Um, you know, a friend, uh, you know, commented to me, hey, did you hear Bitcoin hit $10? And I said, what's Bitcoin? And uh, once he finished explaining that, I was like, wait, wait, wait. There's a non-governmental currency that will never be inflated by politicians and is controlled by math. Okay, yeah, I'd like to take my green pieces of paper and switch for that, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was already all the way down the rabbit hole on Hayek and Mises and Rothbard, and I was ready for a government alternative to inflation. And so it took me about four months, but I managed to convert all of my money to Bitcoin. I mean, this is back in the Gox days, right? So you're sending $500 at a time on a red MoneyGram phone at Walmart. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. the financial rails of the day. Um, but no, I, it gave me the opportunity to move on to the investor side of the equation. Ended up uh, bootstrapping um, 
bid angels back in 2013 to invest in a lot of the early protocols and startups in the space with Michael Turpin and Sam Yilmaz. And uh, yeah, just kind of went from there. Uh, ended up writing the paper on decentralized applications in December of 13. Uh, it was kind of funny. Um, at the time, Charles was kind of starting to uh, formulate the ideas around DAOs. You know, uh, Dan was doing DAX and I was coming out with DAPs. And there's actually a, a whole panel of the three of us. Right? Yeah. yeah, all sort of at that same time, right? And so there's an old panel of the three of us kind of debating the, the terms and how we should characterize these things. But anyway, uh, from there, just been doing blockchain ever since. Uh, work with a lot of protocols, work with a lot of teams in the space, and I've got a family office Master now. That's Coin. all we do. So. And MasterCoin is one of your claims to fame? Uh, yeah. J.R. Willett uh, came to the Bit Angels when I was the executive director in August of 2013, four days before the end of his token sale. I was like, hey, guys, you should check out what we're doing. I was like, oh God, there's only four days left to, to research this. So I just dug in, I did all the due diligence and published a report, an informational report to all the, the members globally and said, hey, you know, somebody's finally putting assets on the blockchain, right? And it was very controversial at the time because the core developers were not a fan of people using for Bitcoin for this purpose. Um, and so I got a lot of pushback from, from folks and I said, you know, these aren't really technical objections. These are ideolog ideological objections. And I'd really like to see assets on the blockchain. And I'm pretty sure this is a permissionless system. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this. And uh, yeah, you know, it worked out. And, you know, now we have Tether and billions of dollars of other assets on the blockchain. And that sparked, a, you know, Vitalik, right, who came in and started making proposals to MasterCoin about how to do scripting, universal scripting, right? Sound familiar? For running what became smart contracts, right? And he ended up deciding he needed a whole another chain to be able to really do what he wanted. Um, so anyway, it's it's been a crazy adventure uh, the last seven or eight years. And so, um, yeah, uh, that's me. I sit on a lot of boards and I try to promote open source systems that are based on voluntary interaction. Um, my Effectively, my motivator is I want to increase human freedom to the maximum extent possible in order to increase prosperity and happiness of people. And now, can so, you move slightly to your side so we can see the flags behind you? Well, you know, you've got uh, good old anarcho-capitalism, you've got uh, Switzerland, you've got all the failed fiat currencies down there. I think uh, Mises is hanging out in the corner, you know, so it's a little Satoshi. You got Hayek, don't forget Hayek. Yeah, Hayek. Yeah, Hayek. Cool. Man. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we might be ideologically aligned in this group, just, you know, a feeling that I have. You know, yeah, just a feeling. Uh, we're going to continue with you in just one second. I, I want to give a shout out to Marco Anabali. He's, um, we're, we're, I'm working with him on a couple of projects. He's going to be a future speaker. And one thing we do with Crypto Wednesdays is prior speakers and future speakers, um, we invite them to join the show also just because they, they're, they're great. They know a lot. We're going to, you know, just to keep it kind of flow, we're going to focus on our three main panelists from the media moment. But Marco is going to join the conversation towards the tail. And I just want everyone to be aware that he's on the call and he's a great guy. So Marco is, you know, waving, uh, I think from sunny Italy, I believe. So he's got, you know, David, he's got some commonality with David. Um, so I just want to give you an acknowledgement in, in a way. So now, David Johnson, let, let me let me shift it back to you. The um, one thing I, I already asked David Orban and Rick is, all, all three of you have strong ideologies. You have strong points of view. You're you're not adverse to making a buck or a euro or a yen or a whatever. You know, I don't know what to say in this crowd, but you want to do well by doing good. And your definition of doing good is highly ideologically informed and really philosophically based. Can you tell us about Yeoman's Capital and how and Pegnet and how you're using real world projects and entities? to channel your efforts, you know, and if someone's watching this, when do they reach out? When do they know that they're relevant and should approach? So That's great. first question is how, you, how are you practically implementing now with your current entities and projects? So I'm practically doing this and I, I wanna echo what David was saying is you have to be willing to put your money where your mouth is 
And being willing to invest in different structures is a really good way to signal that, right? So we were doing that effectively with Bit Angels and the DAPS fund back in 2013, 2014, saying we will invest in tokens. In fact, we will only invest in tokens. We're not interested in traditional equity. We're all Bitcoin people. We all just did MasterCoin. We want to do more of this, right? And writing the DAPS paper was sort of my attempt to describe to entrepreneurs what we believed. We thought things ought to be peer-to-peer. -peer. They ought to be open source. They ought to be based on a blockchain and they needed a token in order to incentivize a particular behavior. And so those four characteristics, what I thought pretty much encapsulated why Bitcoin had been successful, right? Mm -hmm. There was no corporate behind it. It had to be open source. It had to be open access to all. Therefore, it had to be peer-to-peer. -peer. The fact that it was based on a blockchain gave it a level of immutability. And most importantly, there wasn't somebody in the middle with a checkbook. The software could pay for its own hardware. That was one of the fundamental breakthroughs, right? And so once people realized, oh, there are investors that are willing to, you know, invest along these lines, we started getting pitches from all over the world. Um, and effectively, that's what I still do with Yeoman's Capital today is I'm not interested in companies. I'm interested in fundamentally different models. I'm interested in dApps. I'm interested in DeFi. I'm interested in protocols, you know, um, because my outcome probably won't be served with an entity that's rooted in a registration with the state. Now, doesn't mean that you can always get away with not having companies or foundations involved. Often they need to be the ones building on top of the protocols. Mm -hmm. um, and there's gonna be lots of room for private companies to you know, build on these systems but I really strongly believe these systems themselves, these protocols themselves, the actual platforms that we're building can't be rooted in the state. Otherwise, you end up with the Linden Lab situation. So my first exposure to cryptocurrency, or rather virtual currency at the time, was mm -hmm. 2006 in Second Life, right? 2005, 2006, uh, Second Life is taken off. They've got the Linden dollar, right? And people are doing incredible experiments. They're building stock markets and gambling and casinos and all these crazy things inside this virtual world. But it all came to a halt in early 2007 because regulators walked up to the offices in California of Linden Labs and said, guys, do you know what people are doing in this virtual world of yours? You have to stop all these things, right? And that they're like, no, me. no, no. Right, that was, <laughs> and that was the end. That was the end of the interesting experiments in, in Second Life and most people have you know, not really used it because it lost all its momentum. It's up this incredible trajectory of growth and all this commerce going on. And because it was rooted in a company, that came to a halt. And effectively, that's why I was so excited about Bitcoin in 2012. Is like, oh, I've seen this play out before. I know exactly what people are going to do with virtual assets, but this time it's rooted in an open source project that doesn't have a company in the center. Now you... It's kind of interesting giving your initial dispute, I think, with the MasterCoin people. You, you seem to, if I understand correctly, you brought assets on the blockchain into that conversation. People are like, oh, no, that goes against philosophy. And you're like, well, I just care about the tech. But you also, if I recall correctly from a conversation, now in 2020 are concerned about linking physical or real, real financial assets to blockchain because it, it, those presented an attack vector. And you seem to have ar be arguing that synthetic assets, this DeFi route are the way to go. So can you, can you talk about Pegnet and maybe the evolution sure. of your thinking? No, that's, that's a great question. You know, um, what I wanted to see in, in 2013 was sort of all this tokenization happen. And the Bitcoin developers really didn't feel that was inside of the purview of, of Bitcoin, right? They only wanted Bitcoin transactions, quote unquote. Right, and this is at the time they called these colored coins. Colored coins. Yep. There were a number of different open source projects trying to implement this, um, but sort of everybody was looking for sort of the, the perfect implementation, whereas JR was a lot more practical. And he's like, well, I'll just add the records into the UXTO set, which for technical reasons sort of really expands the footprint of data that everybody needs to keep a copy of. So later versions of MasterCoin would keep it in the op return memo field effectively, 
Um, right. And that's a better way to store that data. And then eventually there was multi-sig and other options uh, to store all of this information that the application was reading and saying, oh, this isn't a normal transaction. This is digital gold. This is a digital dollar being sent, right? right. So we needed that tokenization layer. Um, but yes, absolutely. The tokenization that's happened where there is a reserve, I think is very vulnerable. And I've been watching a lot of the regulations form globally, especially recently with the Financial Stability Board, which is a group of all the central banks based yeah. in uh, Basel, Switzerland. And the, uh, <laughs> the G20 went to them last year and they're like, hey, we don't like this Libra thing. Tell us how to regulate it. And they came out in April with a whole set of proposed regulations for quote unquote global stable coins, right? And they're effectively and saying- anything, I, I, I saw that and they actually put stable coins in air quotes, bastards, on the cover. <laughs> you know, it's like the right, yeah, yeah. so-called <laughs> stable coins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so-called. <laughs> right, so-called global stable coins, right. And so, you know, if you look at the things that they're, they're coming out with, which will be implemented by the central banks of the world, they want known validators and audited reserves and, you know, it to be regulated by the central bank of each currency that represents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we're looking at is effectively what we were looking at with ICO regulation in 2017, mm -hmm. right? Everything was fun until the SEC and the Chinese authorities and everybody else came down and said, no, 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 you can't do any of this. This will be ending, right? And we're going to see something similar to that next year when these, these regulations are implemented, but for stable coins, right? And so my belief is you're going to have a huge bifurcation. Either you're going to be Libra or USDC and you're going to be playing the regulated game or you're going to be fully decentralized. There's not going to be anything left in the middle, right? Just like today, you know, you're either a registered security or you've gone fully decentralized on, you know, the token side, it's going to be the same thing, right? And so looking at that, I'm trying to build alternatives as quickly as humanly possible so that we have options to switch to when the regulator in a particular country says, oh, you can't have tether listings anymore. They're an unverified reserve. And okay. this is not a lackadaisical process. I believe you're you think there's a date with destiny coming up fast yeah um and like, i'm not surprisingly deadline. yeah not surprisingly the day after the financial stability board regs came out libra 2.0 released their 2.0 paper and said exactly how they're going to comply with those global regs and a few days earlier that same week the chinese national blockchain committee released mm -hmm. all their regulations. So within one week in April, everybody was distracted with Corona, but within one week in April, we got every major institution on the face of the earth that was a central bank or a large corporate announce exactly how they were going to regulate stable coins going forward. Libra's estimating mid next year. If you look at the comment period and the time for implementation, it's probably sometime middle of next year for all these new regs to go into effect. So yeah, I think we got about 12 months before we hit that wall, right? And that's not a lot of time for switching a lot of trading pairs and moving to alternatives. So I've been donated to open source projects like PegNet, where there is no reserve, there is no collateral. I would describe it as a consensus-based system for these synthetic assets, for these pegged assets, where miners, good old proof of work miners, and soon stakers are being added in PegNet 2.0, submit Oracle prices, every 10 minutes and they come to consensus on what is that median price of all these assets, mm. all these cryptos, all these fiat currencies, gold and silver. And that's the means for verifying the reality of that information, not a reserve that can be captured, not a collateral pool that can be hacked. And if you think about sort of the, the, the how Bitcoin survived, it survived because it didn't have a reserve, right? And that's counterintuitive because everybody's like, oh, Bitcoin has no value because it has no reserve. No, 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 no. Bitcoin had scarcity, right? right? And it had utility in the ability to send payments anywhere in the world. And pretty quickly, people embraced that as means of capital formation, right? So certainly nobody hopefully would say at this point that, oh, it doesn't have reserve, it doesn't have value. Clearly, Bitcoin has shown that if you have 
scarcity and you have these other things, uh, you can certainly have value that holds over time. And so, you know, I am effectively arguing that we can see the same thing, but for all these other assets that are put on the blockchain, but I think it has to come through consensus and not through reserves or collateral. Reserves and collateral are fine if you're willing to be that regulated company. It sounds like you're different. You know, so when I was first hearing you, I was thinking about derivatives and the fact that there's always an underlying. You're, you're not you're not completely decoupling from the physical world you're because you are at least in some cases referencing other assets and coming to a mathematical conclusion about their value right you're, you're not specifically backing like you're in reference to those assets but you're not backed by those assets is that, is that accurate correct so okay. you're referencing the prices and value has to come into the system uh, in the first place and in this case in the case of PegNet, people buy the PEG token, they burn them, and they generate an equal amount of those pegged assets. So you had a million dollars of PEG, and you turned it into a million dollars of pegged Bitcoin, or pegged Ether, or pegged dollars, or pegged gold, whatever you want, right? And then you have that amount of value that you can convert into any of those values inside the system. The important thing is that these systems have no intermediaries. In PegNet, you're not operating with a third person. You're not, it's not an exchange. There's no order book. It's just you and the protocol. So when you say to the protocol, hey, I have a million dollars of peg dollars. I'd like to change those into pegged ether. Protocol mm -hmm. says, great, math checks out, changed over. The dollars are destroyed and the value is moved into the pegged ether. There was no third party. There was no reserve. There was no collateral. This is important from a censorship resistance and an immutability perspective that isn't possible for all of the protocols building on collateral and reserve. And it's also an attack vector from a hacker perspective, right? We've seen all these hacks in DeFi and it's always because they have shared collateral. There's a pool of money sitting somewhere. If only you can get into that account or trick the smart contract and pull that money out, it can be yours, right? And there is no honeypot with PegNet because there's no shared collateral. The value is in each individual wallet. That's also something that was important to Bitcoin is to hack Bitcoin. You had to hack everybody, which was impossible because there wasn't a reserve or collateral sitting somewhere that somebody could grab. Um, uh, Gordon, um, I would like to add that from the point of view of, uh, of the evolution of, of the balance in this global scale of uh, regulators playing their own games and smart people um, getting enthusiastic about possibilities that completely freak out regulators, um, uh, it is important to understand why uh, DAOs matter. Uh, a great leverage that regulators know today have is that they can jail people and they do it. And as long as uh, there are these traditional organizations that are attached to directors and executives, uh, the uh, leverage is going to be there. Uh, but what, what uh, regulators don't realize is that in a world that is rapidly moving, including every profession, creative professions as well, uh, to, to being dominated by AI, the necessity for each of us to be the recipient of a trust that generates the income we need in order to be an active participant from an economic point of view in the world is urgent. Establishing these trusts that are autonomous, that, that uh, uh, are going to back uh, our, um, uh, our ambitions and our dreams and fuel uh, the, the implementation of, of uh, our ideas as we enrich the trusts with further, uh, uh, further fuel uh, to, to propel towards the future, uh, there are 
uh, 8 billion people who, who need to be supported by something that is better than the current uh, social contract. The social contract today clearly says that as long as uh, uh, your economic output uh, as measured by the rest of society is paid a given amount of fiat, you are worth something. As soon as that goes to zero, society feels uh, uh, allowed to throw you in the gutter. And, and to each individual human being that is sufficiently unacceptable to be ready to destroy society if that is the choice they have. So it is in the interest of society and the regulators not to be destroyed by the outrage of 8 billion people who say, sorry, society, but you are wrong. You are a figment of my imagination. You only exist because I allow you to. It doesn't matter how many uh, uh, weapons you are wielding, I will still win. And, and, uh, and whether it is Mahatma Gandhi or, or the bloodiest uh, Bolshevik revolutions, uh, we know that the people will win. So uh, let's uh, be more courageous and let's tell the 1% of the 1%, don't worry, as long as you are not crazy, your head is not gonna roll, and, and let's all of us be smart about this because there's so much we all can gain. Yep, I love that. I, I'm going to use this as an opportunity. Marco, you and I are working on the DevDAO project and we featured that in a prior show. Um, it, just, sorry, Rick, 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 do you need to drop off or are you okay? I absolutely do need to go, guys. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Rick. I want to thank you so much for joining the show. I want to thank David Orban for introducing us to Rick and bringing his esteemed yeah. presence in. Um, you'll Great. provide social media links so we can include them in the show notes so people can follow you and learn more. Okay, I, I appreciate that. David, both of you, good to see you both again. Uh, we have a lot of catching up to do, but thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Sander. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing all of you again pretty soon. Very good, thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show, Rick. Absolutely, you're welcome. Amazing guy, very interesting. Uh, Marco, I'm going to bring you into the conversation briefly, but you and I are working on the DevDAO project. That was a subject of a prior show, and David Orban just brought up DAOs. And you know, when he did that before, mm -hmm. my ears started buzzing. Um, can you give us your take on DAOs and how they interact with this sort of new wave of crypto and blockchain evolution, evolution innovation? And just kind of well, if, if, I, I'm following along with everyone here, and this it's absolutely brilliant uh, depth of thinking and thought uh, going on here. And it, the last sort of 15 minutes of this conversation has, uh, in my objective, uh, sort of trying to stand above it all and look down and say what's really going on here, is the battle between centralization and decentralization. Uh, centralization has been working wonders for centuries, uh, at least for certain people. Um, and centralization, for lack of a better way to put it, has gotten us largely to where we are today. But it's also created most of the problems we're facing today. So the DAOs are our are, are hope <laughs> to get to a place where decentralization actually has relevance and is seen as a better option than centralized. And as you brought up with PegNet, the real problem is how do you get, what's, what is the transition object? How do you go from being a toddler in the, uh, in the centralized world to being a man standing on his own two feet in decentralized world? There needs to be some way to get there. And, you know, people thought stable coins were the way to go. Um, Libra, we could spend 20 minutes here just laughing at what they, what they did and how they did it. <laughs> because as far as I'm concerned, it was just a big social joke from, uh, played on the world by Mark Zuckerberg. But uh, the, the, that transition from you know, a world where we trust in institutions 
and have, are largely rewarded for that trust. Yeah, there's a lot of places where we aren't, but largely we have comfort, we have security, um, that our institutions are going to take care of us. Our institutions are going to keep us free, uh, protect us from bad guys and blah, 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 blah. And those of us who bother to sort of stand back and look at it, realize, okay, that's a lovely fantasy. And if you want to believe it, that's fine, <laughs> but it's not really true. Uh, as, as you said, the ICOs, the, the SEC took a decentralized ecosystem and, or actually second life took a decentralized ecosystem and came in and said, Oh no, 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 no. Boom. Uh, and at the time, there was nowhere they could go. That's what uh, the project that uh, Gordon and I are working on, the DevDAO, we're trying to build the infrastructures that will allow anybody to set up a DAO or any community to set up a DAO and have it be as decentralized as it possibly can be. And we're working towards the goal of eventually not requiring that Swiss association we currently have to have, uh, working towards that. But until we get to a point where there's a, at least some regulatory acceptance of the concept of a DAO. And then, then, and then you stop yourself and you realize I'm just asking for permission to do a DAO. <laughs> <That's Right>. Wrong. <laughs> and yet how else do you do it? Right. The, the only, I mean, I've actually been muddling through my head the, the concept of pegnet and how to sort of get it to work. Um, and, it really, re I, I came down to the point where you, you have to institute it and tell no one you did and get them using it without oh, even realizing they're using it. S sorry again? It Gordon? sounds like Satoshi being anonymous. Well, no, no, that's you anonymous. The actual product has to be anonymous. No one can know they're using it until it's so ubiquitously used that you then, you know, pull back the curtain and everyone goes, oh. But by then it's too late because everyone's using it. It's the Buckminster Fuller process, right? <laughs> Without the announcement, right? It's the whole thing. Don't ask for permission. Ask for forgiveness. Uh, yeah. I, I got it. I like it. Um, Dave, David, do you, do you see DAOs as evolving into acknowledged and regulated entities that I'm using air quotes so that they're going to be... Actually, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear about the David. David Johnson, this question is to David Orban. David Johnson made the point that current entities exist by result of a piece of paper that's a charter that the government acknowledges and, and acquires entityhood or corporate form onto something. Do you see DAOs becoming yet another variant, like an LLC? So at, have at, their the, own at the very beginning, uh, uh, you made a question about uh, how will these new structures uh, uh, evolve and acquire uh, an ability to, to, to exist uh, in front of, of uh, the regulatory pressure. And um, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos uh, puts it uh, beautifully uh, when he talks about infrastructure inversion. He mm -hmm. makes uh, the examples of uh, how the electric uh, um, systems installed in the houses were ridiculed and inferior uh, to lighting with gas until they were not, or how uh, yeah. owning a car uh, was actually a much worse experience than not uh, having a horse-drawn carriage when the roads were muddy uh, and uh, there were no refueling stations, but a little bit of hay could be had uh, uh, regardless of wherever you were and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, sure footed or sure hoofed uh, horses wouldn't uh, get stuck in the mud. Until once again, uh, the roads paved and the um, gas stations installed made uh, the new infrastructure viable. And then what happens is that the old activity becomes a ridiculously small subset of what is possible and it is run on the new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So yes, I fully expect that to happen both uh, with the financial system itself, you know, uh, I don't know how many trillions or tens of trillions uh, we are talking about, uh, and, and, and really uh, uh, 
get accustomed to quadrillions and quintillions. Uh, the names of those orders of magnitude don't mean much, either because uh, they represent uh, a runaway inflation mm -hmm. or because what you want to really look at is, is what do you achieve. But mm -hmm. what is going to happen is that we are going to abandon the 500-year-old uh, system of, of uh, double-entry bookkeeping. We are going to abandon the error-prone um, uh, system of, of uh, creating and running uh, companies that uh, thrives in, in obscurity uh, in a... In a, in a in a manner that is so unaccountable to give birth to the industry of, uh, uh, of consultants and, and uh, accountants and, uh, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the big four uh, consulting companies that are supposedly certifying that you are kosher, except when you uh, steal $4 billion uh, uh, from, from your... Uh, uh, new bank and, mm -hmm. and, and the certification that you receive is <clears throat> worthless. So, so what I am looking at is uh, both what is possible today and the fact that it is not happening is, is scandalous. The fact that uh, I have and have had uh, 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 teams that span the globe including in Pakistan and in Ukraine, and I am getting phone calls from my bank saying if I made payments in prohibited countries and I'm telling them, well, yes, I use TransferWise because you suck and TransferWise is better, but I can tell you, no, I haven't made payments in, in prohibited uh, uh, countries, but, but what about Ukraine? And I tell them, well, as far as I know, Ukraine, at least until yesterday, wasn't on the list of prohibited countries. And then they go like, okay, but what about the Donbass area? And I go, wow, that's smart. You caught me there. Actually, I don't know if the subcontractors I'm using for doing beautiful code dare to live in the contested area between Russia and Ukraine of Donbass. Mm -hmm. And yes, I am paying them for the code they write. And yes, code is even more dangerous than the arms that some people would buy with that money, as we know, and that is, as is proven by uh, your panic. <laughs> but yeah. uh, 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 that, is, that is not even the point. The point is, how are we going to implement the next phases of the co-evolving human machine civilization to colonize the solar system. Is it going to be based on banknotes and on, on uh, 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 LLCs uh, incorporated in Delaware? Are the autonomous robots in swarms as they assign each other uh, resources of energy and transportation and communication going to use checkbooks or, or, or uh, credit cards? Uh, are, are they going to uh, uh, convone, convene uh, uh, boards of directors meetings uh, uh, in the Canary Islands or or in Barbados, and 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 the, I, actually, I want to keep that last part. Well, but but absolutely, well, that's exactly is the okay point. Too. The yeah. robots are gonna do the hard slog, and yeah. we can have uh, uh, fun in the sun and have sex and 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 and. <laughs> dream about poetry and, and do all the things that, that we are good uh, to, to do. Uh, the, the modern slavery of jobs that everybody's talking about, oh my God, robots are stealing our jobs. Let them, let them. I cannot wait. I want to be jobless. I want to be unemployed. I do not want a corporation to be able to claim that the corporation is employing me. I want to thrive through the benefit of billions of robots working for me in things that I cannot even comprehend, but the quintillion dollars of value that they are generating are going to make each of us 
eight or 10 or 20 billion humans, billionaires, yes. And, and, and then it is up to us to work out what is the purpose of our own lives uh, in a manner that, that is compatible with our human robot limitations, whichever they are, uh, as, we, as we push them out, searching for longevity, searching for constant uh, sources of, of awe and curiosity and, and, and passion. Yeah, that's, I'm just listening I'm to this. And I don't, on that because it was beautiful. That, that was like the... <laughs> I love it. Thunder, I, I think... There was a... Marga, you want, you want to have something? Give, give us the one I just wanted to catch... In the middle of that, he said the one thing that we need in order to move from where we are today into that world where... Uh, we don't require institutions, um, and that is accountability. If everybody on this planet was accountable for their actions individually, and then as collectives wherein they formed collectives, if they had accountability, you wouldn't need regulators. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, Sandra, we I, can I build that. We can build that. <laughs> you and I are working on it. Sandra, I think we had a great show. These these guests are amazing. I, you know, thank you, Marco, for joining in our as an alumni or future alumni speaker. Um, I want to thank David. I want to thank everyone, but I really want to thank David Orban for coming up with the theme. Though of course we went wide as we tend to do on these shows, uh, for introducing us to. Of course, now trash is starting outside. For introducing us to David Johnston, Mr. Dapp, uh, for introducing us to Rick Willard, who, you know, is, has a just redefining value and the creation of value. I, th I think this is great. So Sandra, why don't you, I'm gonna pass it back to you, my yeah. co-host. Thank you, Gordon. I, I'm, I'm really happy that we took the initiative to get our, just let, let's say over a month ago to, to organize this Crypto Wednesdays because all the value that you get from, you know, these experienced people from different continents in, in the world is, you know, I think we can continue this conversation for another two hours. So I would like to thank uh, David, Marco, uh, Rick, and another David for being on the show today. We're really grateful for you, and we would like to re-invite you for one of the upcoming shows because I think you give tremendous value, not only to ourselves, but also to the, to the audience, and we really appreciate that. So thank you for that. I think, Gordon, this was, this was really a good show. I would like to also invite everybody that was watching the live stream also check out our YouTube channel where you can see the previous uh, episodes because this was Crypto Wednesday number six and the previous five were also a really um, yeah, good, good, good shows and we're looking forward also to next week's show. So I, I think, Gordon, we're not going to mention who our next guest speaker is, but no. we have something in the, in the funnel with, and this is going to be fantastic, uh, even though it's hard to top today's crypto show. So I would like to invite all our- We love all our guests equally. We like, they're like our children. <laughs> they're, they're, everybody's important in their own way. So we would like to invite our guest speakers that are attending today also to join next week because we like to bring people also to, to the live shows. So we would really appreciate your, your attendance also there. And if there's any way we can, you know, pay back whatever you did for us, that we, we are happy uh, to do that. So besides thanking our guest speakers, uh, Gordon and myself, we would also like to thank, again, uh, Iconic Digital Asset Management from Amsterdam for making this uh, uh, possible. They are our premium sponsor. So thank you for that. I would like to thank our viewers, our live viewers and everybody that was watching online on YouTube or maybe watching the recording. And I think that's it for today, Gordon. So we gotta thank Luke. Luke is the man. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. And I don't want to forget Luke because he's our really important moderator. So he's working behind the scenes to make everything possible on the technical side. So Luke, thanks again for that. We will upload the recording I think within the next couple of hours or latest tomorrow in Central European time. So for now, I wish we wish everybody a good day. Enjoy your evening or your afternoon or maybe your morning. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Same time, same link, different uh, uh, panel. And we look forward to seeing you there. So for now, I'll be off of Gordon and myself and all the speakers. Have a good day. We'll see you next week, Crypto Wednesday. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Everyone.